Okay, looks like we've we've asymptoted in the number of participants here, so this is great. Um, hi everyone, my name is Deep Ganguly. I'm the um, Director of Research at HAI, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Mitchell Stevens. Mitchell is the faculty co-lead of the Pathways Lab here at Stanford. He's also a professor of education, um, and he's pursued multi-method studies of alternative K through 12 education, selective college admissions, and the political economy of higher education. In addition to his scholarly work, he writes and speaks frequently for national and international policy audiences. Um, I'm extremely excited uh, about his talk on MOOCs. Um, we had a lot of fun kind of discussing this uh, beforehand, and um, I'm really just happy to have you here, Mitchell. And without further ado, please, uh, please take it away. Oh, actually, sorry, before we start, sorry, sorry few house rules. Um, I will be monitoring this Slido for your questions throughout the talk. So to get there, you can point your mobile at that QR code, or you can go to our HAI uh, website, and it should be uh, in, in bright sort of letters where to find the Slido. And then um, we'll also put that in the chat later on. And at the end of Mitchell's talk, um, I will be looking at those questions to sort of feed them over so we can um, have a discussion. So sorry for that interruption. Without further ado, Mitchell, please take it away. Thank you, Deep. Let's try the screen share here. Can you all see my screen and hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I've really been looking forward to uh, to this opportunity uh, to um, continue some critical reflective work on um, what I think is a um, actually quite important uh, uh, moment in the history of, of US, in fact, global higher education. Um, uh, I want to put a picture like this up and, and just take a heat check really quickly among those in the audience. Um, if you want to if you want to put a remark um, in the channel that's available to you, or just think um, in your in, in your mind's eye or in your heart. When I say MOOC, uh, you know what emoticon would you attach to it? A thumbs up, a thumbs down, a smiley face, a frowny face, a question mark. If you go online, it'll take you about thirty seconds of web searching to find that. Uh, uh, most opinion makers and academics uh, would describe MOOCs with a frowny face or a thumbs down or at best a question mark. Here's a quote from literally the first article that surfaced on my web search. Um, uh, this is from Derek Newton of Forbes in July 2020. Uh, he writes, MOOCs are the massive open online courses that were supposed to upend everything in higher education. They were supposed to be free and open to everyone with online access, bringing the best possible content from the best schools and best professors to everyone. The hype was breathless. The New York Times declared 2012 the year of the MOOC. The hype was exceeded only by the failure, which has been well documented, and the news isn't getting much better. He continues, that's because from the start, MOOCs had abysmal completion rates. While they attracted tens of thousands of quote unquote students, very few uh, stuck around long and evidence emerged that a heavy proportion of MOOC attendees already had college degrees or were already actually teaching the subject they were supposed to be studying. It has also become clear that MOOCs serve the most motivated students, those who likely find a pathway to achievement with or without a MOOC. And I wanna say the occasion of this article um, was a, a peer-reviewed uh, meta-analysis that appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2020 and was authored by uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, Stanford, co-authored by some Stanford researchers um, and those from other institutions. I think some of them may be on the call. Um, so this was a, a, a direct response you know, to a meta-analysis of research in the sector. Um, uh, and I, I recognize that you know, success or failure is not a technical exercise, um, but nevertheless, I think it's important to acknowledge the general assessment that the world has made of MOOCs. This is important partly because MOOCs were perhaps the most ambitious experiment in mass access that historically admissions exclusive universities had ever pursued. 
But it also is important because massively open online courses are part of a much larger dynamic. I'll go so far as to call it tumult in the political economy of credential provision. In my remarks today, I wanna to do two things. First, I'll offer an explanation for why there is a general sense among educators and educational researchers that MOOCs failed as instructional technologies and as platforms for doing science. But second, I'll provide a different angle on MOOCs and their legacy that recovers their implication for education, research, and practice generally. And I'll suggest that those implications are still very much under development. In other words, still very much in the hands of all of us as educators and researchers and business people. My hope is that this recasting of the MOOC legacy might inform researchers and academic planners to proactively engage with the scientific possibilities and organizational challenges posed by digitally mediated instruction. I believe that this task is especially important for Stanford because whether or not we may have known what we were getting into, we were instrumental in bringing massively open online courses into the world. If MOOCs quote unquote failed, then we owe it to ourselves to collectively and reflectively understand why. If MOOCs change the landscape of education, science and instructional provision, as I'll argue today, then we also owe it to ourselves to understand why. I should tell you a little bit about where I am in all of this. Um, I'll provide two coordinates. Um, the first is that I did not assemble these remarks from some Archimedean point outside the history I'm recounting. From 2012 to 2019, I occupied two appointments at Stanford in which I was specifically charged with developing data infrastructure and access protocols to enable scientific research in environments like MOOCs. My work here is part of an ongoing effort to make sense of why I was successful in that effort only to a very modest degree. Um, and also to try to make sense of what I believe are the still highly ambiguous conditions for educational research and learning science uh, in digitally mediated environments to the present day. The second coordinate is that I'm not a learning scientist or an expert in any other dimension of learning per se. I'm a sociologist. I study the organization, production, and politics of knowledge, specifically in universities. So I will take, my take is going to be on the organization, production, and politics of knowledge that characterized the MOOC phenomenon. That said, several of my closest colleagues are learning scientists. I think some of them are on this call, uh, so they can keep me honest as well. But first, let's get to the same page on the origins and history of the MOOC phenomenon. The term MOOC was first coined in 2008 and applied to a course produced by Canadian educators Stephen Downs and George Siemens to refer to, to a project they called Connectivism and Connectivity Knowledge. The, pro the project initially enrolled 25 students at the University of Manitoba, but eventually included over 23,000 people from around the world. That course was a fairly radical experiment in horizontally distributed sense-making, but it's not one of the MOOCs most people worldwide first heard about. That honor goes to the handful of courses made available online by some Stanford computer science instructors and faculty beginning in 2011. Their frequently cited Ur MOOC is Peter Norvig and Sebastian Thrun's Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, which enrolled over 160,000 people from around the world and had over 20,000 completers. Soon thereafter, Thrun created Udacity. His colleagues, Andrew Eng and Daphne Kohler launched their startup Coursera. Stanford created the Vice Provost for Online Learning and named computer scientist John Mitchell to the post. And Harvard and MIT jointly created the nonprofit provider, MOOC provider edX. Wow. For those who lived and worked in the sector through those years, it was a heady, fast-moving, and very unpredictable time. Now, why and how, we might ask, did these Stanford computer scientists come up with the clever idea to offer their courses online for free? Part of the answer undoubtedly lies in the long history of Stanford School of Engineering offering technologically mediated distance learning. 
as far back as 1969, Stanford had leased rights to its own television station so that it could convey very well-subscribed and, frankly, very profitable courses toward accredited graduate degrees in engineering throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and here's, here's an image um, uh, from the Stanford archives uh, depicting our transmitter on Black Mountain, which was training radio waves far enough so that um, the the corporations that were in, in, employing, uh, in, in, involving their employees in this program, uh, the Honors Cooperative Project could take the courses via television from their uh, corporate offices throughout Silicon Valley. Um, and with uh, you know special emphasis, making sure that the waves got to the industrial sector of the South of Market neighborhood in San Francisco uh, uh, and to our colleagues over, over in the East Bay. Um, uh, and Stanford uh, graduate Alex Kindle and I uh, just published a paper on this legacy, uh, which not coincidentally, we began the research on around 2013. Uh, during those heady moments, some colleagues said, you know, the School of Engineering had this television station. Maybe you should go check that out. Um, uh, Alex had some very good days in the archives, as the historians say, um, and uh, we, we learned of this longer legacy. Um, the latter day instantiation of that legacy is the Stanford Center for Professional Development, which to this day pervades a wide array of instructional offerings worldwide. Technologically mediated high quality distance learning was essentially taken for granted by Stanford engineering faculty in 2011. In fact, many of them were already posting their lectures and course materials for Stanford's campus-based students online and not mandating in-person attendance even for the residential undergraduate. So the innovation in 2011 was in giving away some versions of those courses free of charge and offering non-credit bearing certificate to those who successfully completed them. Now, combine that, that free Stanford course, uh, with no small amount of Palo Alto versus Cambridge one-upmanship were it in the blender of Silicon Valley's venture capital fueled hype machine, and you get the fluffy confection called MOOC mania. I want to recognize that here the good work of uh, sociologist Ben Gebra Medin, who's now at Mount Holyoke College, who was in residence uh, at Stanford and in Cambridge during those years, and has a forthcoming book on the MOOC phenomenon on which I now rely. And his work makes clear that we should not underestimate the causal force of the Harvard versus Stanford status competition in driving MOOC mania. And it was in general, a pivotal part of the story. Now, some might be asking, isn't there another pretty good school in Cambridge? I think it's called MIT. Uh, uh, and I wanna be sh sure and say that um, on my view, at, you know, MIT has been sort of the admirable pace setter here and no question it's historically important in the story that I'm describing, but let's just say I'm sparing uh, Kendall Square in, uh, incrimination in the story that I'm telling at this, at this, uh, on this morning. Now, one part of the enthusiasm for massively open online courses on the campuses of Harvard, Stanford, MIT, the University of Edinburgh, and a few other research university campuses was the great promise that MOOCs seemed to hold for producing new knowledge. Indeed, perhaps a whole new science of teaching and learning. The DNA of that scientific promise is embedded in this graphic, which I should say is a direct quote from a talk by a computer scientist uh, that I will cite in a very few minutes. Um, and uh, an, an image that was very compelling to me um, and, and, and to, to, uh, uh, at the same time. The basic instructional architecture uh, that's represented by this graphic, right? You've got a, you've got a, a, a learner slash student in front of the computer. Uh, she is interacting via the magic of the cloud with an API and a web server that's sitting on a campus somewhere. Um, and uh, each and every interaction that that learner is having with um, the instructional platform is being digitally captured and combined with others. Um, uh, that's what I mean by the basic architecture here. Um, the Stanford computer scientists who brought MOOCs to world fame intuitively and immediately understood 
that this mechanism of observation could be a scientific game changer. They understood as well that it could in theory be a game changer for instructional practice because the same platforms that enable observation can also in theory enable intervention. And I should say that this insight long preceded MOOCs per se, as early as the 1990s, HAI's John Etchemendy and the service of Stanford President Gerhard Casper was helping Stanford invest in the core promise of this idea. And it's during those years that Stanford recruited Roy P to help develop this vision and establish the learning sciences at Stanford. The basic insight embedded in this picture also is what Candace Pill and her colleagues at Carnegie Mellon understood with the courses developed through the Open Learning Initiative, or OLI. Yet despite this great promise, I would submit that there has been no data science revolution in education, at least not yet. To be sure, there's been a non-trivial amount of scientific activity in MOOC space and on parallel digitally mediated learning technologies. Yet education research as it is practiced in schools of education, schools of public policy, and disciplinary social science departments has not, at least not yet, significantly shifted in the substantial ways that many of us predicted that it would. How come? Why haven't we seen the revolution in education and learning research that has so long been anticipated? Now, I want to be clear, this moment produced, you know, not only a good bit of science, but also an extraordinary cache of scientists, the scholarship, and, and we produced a lot of good scientists here, and I think some of them, again, are on the call, um, and so did several other schools uh, uh, yeah, worldwide, um, and in a sense, um, I'm assembling these <laughs> remarks, uh, you know, uh, partly in honor of, of uh, their ambition and their possible futures. Um, I, you know, we, I think we still need to figure out, you know, kind of why the promise embedded in these technologies has not metastasized um, into a truly transformative science of, of education or learning. And this, I would submit, is a question in which the toolkit of the sociology of knowledge and science studies more broadly comes in handy. Here, I'm going to lean on scholarly work of the sort that Stanford faculty such as Dan McFarland, Lee Powell, Emily Levine, John Molinsky, Fred Turner, and others do. One of the most powerful widgets in these folks' toolkits is that science is a networked process. It's high stakes collective action in which parties distributed across space and time simultaneously cooperate and compete with each other for scarce resources. What kinds of resources? Funding, data, faculty appointments, graduate students, acolytes, attention, journal pages, fame. To secure these things, scientists collectively engage in highly routinized forms of writing, speaking, problem specification, data instrumentation, evaluation, and peer review. And different networks of scientists, call them scientific communities, have different sometimes radically different protocols for doing all of these things. And their protocols are rooted in long traditions of sense-making that their practitioners simultaneously take for granted and hold as inarguable, even sacrosanct. So I do this stuff so routinely that I don't even think that I'm making a decision except when someone else does something differently. Um, and I experience that difference as a kind of affront, right? As a kind of challenge to... Um, to, to the way in which I go about doing academic science. Okay. Um, now, when the MOOC phenomenon emerged, it was strongly associated with computer scientists. Now, computer science is a vast, variegated, and resource-rich world of knowledge production. People who work in this academic domain tend to take what science studies people call an engineering approach to their endeavors. Engineers solve other people's problems. The more carefully specified and data trailed those problems, the better. Computer scientists are very comfortable navigating huge corpora of digital information. They take great challenge and pleasure in finding patterns in corpora that can provide insight into the complex problems their clients want to solve. They're famously ecumenical about the problems they are willing to consider estimating the pace of ocean warming, 
modeling the circulation of automobile traffic in Bangkok, designing online marketplaces for vacation home rentals, identifying genomic sequences associated with the transmission of hereditary diseases. All of these are fair game for computer scientists. They tend to default to pre-collected digital traces of the empirical phenomena they investigate. And outside of the burgeoning subfield of human-computer interaction, HCI, computer scientists rarely have much contact with the physical dynamics, human beings, exchanges, and transactions that their data describe. They work with the data right, to model the phenomena um, um, behind the data. Computer scientists also have a long history of working in tandem with major government agencies and deep-pocketed private corporations. As a group, they are among the most richly patronized and influential academic scientists the world has ever known. Now, testament to the ambition and resourcefulness of computer science as a scientific domain, the Association for Computer Machinery, ACM, the primary professional association for U.S. computer scientists, created a new academic conference, Learning at Scale, in 2014 to accrete scholarship on, 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 on MOOC data primarily, but not exclusively. Uh, Stanford's Mehran Sahami served as chair of that inaugural conference. And I think the creation of this conference is a very important piece of science history. Consider that there were many academic associations and conferences on education and learning in 2014, but not conferences specifically by and for computer scientists. And what did the computer scientists do? They used the power of their own professional association to build their own conference, right? So learning at scale was at least in part, and if only implicitly, an act of turf claiming, right? Learning. Computer scientists can do learning. Here we are, right? Um, another important historical detail is that the computer scientists called their conference learning at scale, not education at scale. More on that in a few minutes. All right. Um, now, MOOCs themselves, the courses, were pretty much something new under the sun to another group of scientists, economists and sociologists of higher education. And again, full disclosure, this is my own scientific community. These scholars live in schools of education and public policy and in disciplinary departments of economics and sociology. In other words, they live on the other side of campus. They tend to have much narrower empirical foci than computer scientists. For the most part, these researchers stake their scholarship on understanding what demographic factors are related to college entry, persistence, and completion, and how college completion is in turn related to various life chances, earnings and occupation, wealth accumulation, marital stability, civic participation, physical health, right? things that happen to people by virtue of completion or non-completion of college. A very large proportion of this scholarship is about returns to easily measured educational credentials, associates, bachelors, and professional master's degrees among them, right? That's what governments count. Uh, that's what we count. That's, that's how academic progress is modeled around degree completion. Now, there's something important about this domain that I need to emphasize and perhaps, you know, Pache, uh, the learning sciences, confess, educational social scientists are not interested in learning. Historically, they haven't measured learning. And by and large, colleges and universities have not measured learning. U.S. state and federal governments in no way require that learning be assessed or, or measured in college. And for better or worse, remember, I, I don't make the rules here, right? Sociologists and economists of higher education either presume that learning happens as a function of credential completion, or they infer that employers are rationally rewarding learning and skills when they give wage premiums to, to college graduates, or they argue that learning is orthogonal or even irrelevant to the, hire, to the hiring transaction in which academic degrees are rewarded. So when educational social scientists turned what little attention to MOOCs they did lend to them, they saw failed college courses. Why? 
because most people who enrolled in MOOCs did not complete them and because MOOC completions did not contribute to the sorts of already measured accredited credentials that these social scientists were used to building their analyses around. Recall the quote from my introduction, MOOCs were a failure because people didn't finish them. If you learned how to care for a dying loved one from a MOOC on palliative care, or got some fresh techniques for helping your child with algebra from a MOOC on math anxiety, or you were able to embellish your interview for a job as a data analyst by skimming a few MOOCs in advanced statistics, none of these things were scientifically relevant to the educational social sciences because they couldn't analytically see or measure them. In this way, I would argue that educational social sciences failed massively open online courses at least as much as the other way around. But of course, there was a third scientific community implicated in the MOOC phenomenon and weighed in on it early on. This is the community of learning scientists of which my Stanford GSE colleagues, Roy P., Dan Schwartz, Shelley Goldman, Bridget Barron, Victor Lee, Nick Haber, and others are key members. Uh, and I believe, again, some of them are on the call, so keep me honest. Um, learning science traces its intellectual origins to developmental and cognitive psychology with a good measure of sociolinguistics and more recently neuroscience as part of the intellectual portfolio. For these researchers, learning, not educational credentials, is the central object, hence an inherent tension between them and the economists and sociologists who are agnostic about or even skeptical about learning. Learning scientists are found mostly, but not exclusively, in schools of education. Historically, learning sciences have defaulted to a certain kind of learning subject. This subject is a human being, and in this, they differ markedly from computer scientists who historically are at least as interested in machine learning or learning at the human-machine intersection as they are about human beings. Second, learning scientists presume subject is a child not the mature adults who are the primary consumers of MOOCs. And we can talk about why that presumed subject historically has been a child for the learning sciences, but we'll do that some other time. Third, learning scientists' presumed learning relationships are interpersonal and social. They're occasionally augmented by computational tools, but, but nevertheless, learning scientists tend to presume that learning is a fundamental, essentially human to human kind of endeavor. As a group, learning scientists take great care in describing and designing what they call learning environments for particular kinds and combinations of human learners. And unlike computer scientists and educational social scientists, they routinely collect their own data, often in experimental or quasi-experimental designs, and they worry a lot about learners as complex cognizers. Right. You have to understand the learner as a whole person and the context of learning as complex. So when computer scientists released their MOOCs to the world, many learning scientists experienced them as a kind of affront or even a snub. Who were these people with their ad hoc learning platforms? What expertise did they have that made them appropriate architects of learning environments? And why were they so confident about putting these things out into the world? without any scientifically conscientious foundation or pedagogical design. And remember, partisans of scientific communities effectively live in different worlds. They use different vocabularies, they go to different conferences, they publish in different journals, they use different ma mathematical operations and statistical packages. Some of them write up their papers in LaTeX, some of them write up their papers in Microsoft Word. Very different worlds, right? Both, both, both at the sort of routine level of academic practice and ultimately epistemologically as well. I would suggest that it is in this network hole between these different scientific communities that what I have come to call MOOC science fell in between in a non networked space. And I want to shout out also the MIT trained anthropologist. Uh, Sriharsh Kelkar, um, who's now at Berkeley and who was also on site in Palo Alto in Cambridge as a researcher during those years. And his dissertation field work has substantially informed my thinking here. I want to be clear. Um, a lot, I have about 10 minutes more remarks and then we'll open it up for discussion. A lot of MOOC science 
have gotten done in the last 10 years. And in fact, the first big takeaway I hope you glean from my remarks is that the landscape of educational research has changed, was changed by the MOOC phenomenon. Uh, in the creation of MOOC science, computer scientists, learning scientists, and educational social scientists became newly aware of each other. We occasionally were in the same rooms in Google Hangouts together. We occasionally write papers together. We occasionally try to work across the non-trivial divides between us. But the imagined scientific revolution that might in theory be enabled by digital mediation of instruction remains largely conjectural. Strategies and goals of cooperation across the scientific domains are still very much under production. And at present, most of the scientific action in digital learning is happening at the intersection of CS and learning science, I think for several reasons. First, these can't share a default object, learning, right, um, which educational social scientists have historically avoided. Also, the default imagery of a cognizing subject, a learner, is amenable to the kinds of experimental designs uh, that learning scientists with their roots in psychology are understand and are comfortable with. And this imagery of a learner also comports with the user um, that is the default subject of HCI research. So I'm not surprised that the, most of the work has been at that intersection. And while productive, this focus on individual human actors learning things, rather than a focus on educational credentials and their value, it leads what are, in my view, biased view, crucial public policy questions questions about whether and if credentials certify actual learning, about what kinds of organizations can legitimately confer educational credentials, about how credentials, how much credentials should cost, and whether the conferral of those credentials should be underwritten by public subsidies, um, and about how employers make sense of new credentials that are being provided by these new online platforms and about whether legacy institutions like Stanford should be systematically measuring the learning that is uh, implicitly represented by those, those credentials. Um, you know, we don't have a science yet addressing those questions. Um, so the second big takeaway I hope that you get from my remarks is that if there has been no uh, revolutionary change in how education and learning science happen, it's a function of the organization and politics of scientific production not a limitation of data, money, or even scientific will. It's been an outcome perhaps of a failure of imagination, a failure of knowing how to cooperate across fairly significant scientific distances, and a failure to date of developing kind of shared goals or problems that all of these communities can share. But I have a, I have a, a, I have a thought, right? Um, and here's, here's my modest proposition. Um, and it comes directly from the heady days of MOOC mania, and it is, to me, what remains the most powerful affordances of digitally mediated instruction for learning science and educational social science. Uh, and the, the core imagery that I want to suggest that might bring these different scientific communities together is an imagery of sequence, pathways, and progress. Now recall this picture once again, right? Recall that this is a context in which it is possible to observe minute stepwise progress through academic programs, um, both individually and at scale in ways that were never possible before. It's an insight that Stanford CS professors David Dill and John Mitchell put to work in one of their classes during this era, CS 103 Mathematical Foundations of Computing, together with CS doctoral student John Basson. That image I just showed you and the few that follow are direct quotes from a presentation that these scholars assembled around the year 2015, uh, reprinted with permission, of course. Um, so here's the basic logic of this, of this project. Um, uh, the folks are, you know, they're, they're teaching mathematical foundations of computing and they're, they're teaching how students develop mathematical proofs, right? So uh, the task is to move from one symbolic statement to another um, in a logically explicit and reasonable way. Um, uh, and there's more than one way to get from the, from, the, from the beginning of the problem to the end, right? Like solving a maze, right? Um, there's, there's a place to start and a place to end, but there are multiple possible ways to get to the conclusion. Um, 
And what these guys did was they, they, you know, they put this project in that digitally mediated platform that I just, they described earlier. And then they developed a flag graphing technique to model how students progress right through the problem. Um, so the image at the bottom across the horizontal axis are um, instances of efforts to get to a solution. Um, and uh, on the vertical axis are the moves that students make to get to that solution. And the white dots represent when a move is attempted, uh, but, but, but the student uh, you know, fails at that move, right? And so what this you know, enabled them to do was to see that you know, different students around, you know, went on this journey uh, in very different ways, at very different paces, with very different sequence of moves. This is a very powerful scientific and pedagogical idea. And over the years, it has animated the enthusiasm of a great many scientists and business people and venture capitalists, right? People backing entities like Coursera. Um, and more on that in a moment. But here's the thing. Despite the power of this mode of instructional observation and intervention, it is deceptively and perhaps even damningly incomplete. On its own, this technology of observation cannot accommodate that these moves are made by embodied human beings with biographies that inform how they approach new problems and make sense of their coursework people with emotional responses to what they are learning and who are often learning side by side with one another, comparing their own sense of academic self with those of others. On its own, this observational strategy cannot fully recognize that whatever is happening through the, uh, through the observed digital platform inevitably is embedded in some sort of organizational structure, almost always a hierarchical and at least somewhat competitive structure. On its own, this observational strategy can't help us understand the politics inherent in tying observed academic progress to formal certifications or non-progress to formal sanction. And so at the same time that these spectacularly rich new flows of data describing interactions on digital media are tantalizingly promising, there ultimately is rather little meaningful scientific progress that can be made with these data all by themselves and the techniques necessary for mining them all by themselves. Building that science would require much more coordination right, uh, and cooperation among scientific communities uh, than has yet to be achieved by any university that I know of. Now, all that said, I don't wanna end on the note of glass half empty. In fact, doing so would contravene my thesis, which is, that MOOCs and MOOC science had powerful forward effects on the organization of the whole post-secondary sector. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, first, I mean, we shouldn't forget that massively open online courses gave millions of people, millions of hours of learning experiences that might otherwise, they might otherwise never have had. Most of those experiences did not sum to formal certification. And even if they had, Social scientists are still without tractable means of gauging the labor market value of MOOC degrees, right? But a lot of people did learn to do a lot of things through MOOCs. My, recent, uh, my lab recently released a study led by doctoral student Crystal Laria documenting the wide range of utilities people gleaned from Stanford's free MOOCs, whether or not they completed those MOOCs. As I intimated earlier, these men and women did learn a lot of things that helped them take care of their dying loved ones, gave them clues to help their kids with math homework and burnish their resumes uh, and impress hiring committees. Second, I mean that quite a few of our colleagues here at Stanford and indeed in many institutions all over the world have done some incredible things through their innovations in MOOC space. They've helped thousands of Americans make sense of contemporary presidential politics. That's Rob Reich and team. They've created deeply meaningful communities of mathematics teachers and learning, uh, learners. That's Joe Bowler's team. They're teaching a widely distributed network of computer science learners how to code. That's Chris Peach and team. And it's hard to fully capture or quantify these contributions to learning, let alone to the national or global public good. But they're clearly substantial. Third and finally, I would submit that massively open online courses 
did a great deal to dislodge longstanding presumptions about what a college course is, who can legitimately convene one, through what media, and how much a college course and the credentials to which they accumulate should cost. Since the middle of the last century, legally accredited colleges and universities have held a virtual cartel on course certifications that their holders can exchange in labor markets for well-compensated jobs. Until MOOC mania, pretty much everyone took that cartel for granted, even if not especially the for-profit colleges and universities whose predatory, exploitative practices ruined the financial circumstances of millions of Americans in the years immediately preceding MOOC mania. I would suggest that massively open online courses precipitated an ongoing challenge to the presumption that a valuable post-secondary certification is necessarily a two-year or four-year graduate diploma from, a, from an accredited college or university. There are now a huge array of credentials and credential providers vying for eyeballs, enrollment fees, government subsidy, and labor market value. It's a wild west that will ultimately get settled, but nobody yet knows just how, by whom, and with what consequences for the legacy providers. I'll stop there. Thank you, Mitchell. That was delightful. Um, so I kind of want to kick us off here by asking you the same question you asked us in the beginning of your presentation, which was your fr initial framing was most opinion makers and academics would describe MOOCs with a frowny face um, emoji. And then you kind of presented us with your sort of deep thinking. And maybe to wrap it up at the risk of being overly reductive, which emoji would you ascribe to this um, and why? Oh, oh, that's, oh, that's great. Um, I, 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 I hadn't even thought that someone would ask that question back to me, so good for you. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, I, would go, I would go with question mark, frankly. I mean, to the extent um, the, uh, uh, you know, no one, really important to remember, nobody planned MOOC mania, right? This was not a, a foreordained, um, educational project. Um, and what was part of what was so thrilling about it, uh, living through it, was that it, it was it was kind of obvious to everybody that nobody that, that the phenomenon was larger than any one party could control. Um, and uh, my own sense is that because this enterprise was brought into the world by organizations that historically are very risk averse, very planful, very stepwise in what they do, um, that the, the, the inability to control and define the phenomenon was, was part of why it produced so much anxiety um, and, um, and, and, and part of why, on my view, the, the schools that were most instrumental, with the possible exception of MIT, um, that were most instrumental in, in, in producing this phenomenon, um, you know, have yet to define a kind of clear narrative for what's happening uh, or what happened, what that meant. Um, and I guess I would suggest that, um, you know, we see that moment of uncertainty and ambiguity as, as a productive one, right? Um, that, that, that opened up conversations, frankly, like the one that we're having today, um, uh, in which, you know, different kinds of scientists are, are trying to, to build a new kind of empirical inquiry, but we don't yet know how to do that, right? Um, uh, and so that's why I guess I would opt for for question mark, it's kind of up to us to decide um, as educators and scientists to decide, you know, what we do with the uncertainties and ambiguities that the MOOC phenomenon, uh, you know, brought, you know, brought to our institution. Yeah, I, that, that's, that's nice to hear my prediction for what you would say, and my feeling leaving away listening to your marks mm -hmm. was also question mark, which is exciting, because I think that's an opportunity to sort of explore this further. So uh, along those lines, you know, another really nice framing that you provided us today um, is that, you know, science, as you say, is a networked action and people from different fields have different protocols um, for sort of getting their science done. And to sort of summarize, um, you kind of talked about three main groups of people, computer scientists, educational economists, 
economists and sociologists, which is your community, and also mm -hmm. learning scientists. And you kind of discussed sort of how they think about things through their own perspectives and lenses. And um, you called that sort of what you called, I think you, you referred to it as a gap between at least those mm -hmm. three fields. And you drew a circle and you called that sort of MOOC science, which mm -hmm. is interesting because it sounds, at least the way you drew it on the slide, it sounds like um, it's yet to be filled. So I think you outlined the challenge is that you all, the people from these communities occasionally try to work together, but it's a very non-trivial divide. And I think you, when you use mm -hmm. the word failure, you said it's a failure of knowing how to collaborate or even define shared goals, which one mm -hmm. can work towards. Um, mm -hmm. So I suppose this mm -hmm. is like a, a two-part question. One, is that synthesis correct? And two, if it is, um, what do you view as the path forward to yeah. flesh out the MOOC science gap? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I, I you know, I, I live in California, so I shouldn't call it a failure. I should say it's a, it's a challenge, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what I what I tried to describe was what what uh, network researchers call a structural hole, right? There's this sort of space between, as you understand, right? There's this many on the call do this space between networks that um, mm -hmm. um, that is that, that is very thin with ties, and so it's it, it's very hard to do work at those intersections without them fairly uh, proactive planning, often from a, from a third party, I think, right? Um, but we could talk about that later. Um, and I would suggest that, you know, what, you know, MOOC science came into being, but it came into being around the edges of these other networks, right? Um, and it didn't, it, it, you know, it, it, it didn't, um, co it hasn't yet coalesced into a kind of synergistic project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is, we don't, none of us agree on what we're trying to study, right? Like, um, if, if you're studying learning and I'm studying returns to credentials, then we don't really have a lot to talk about um, because, because we can each pursue our work independently of each other, right? If you're right. doing your work with found data and I'm trying to design, you know, you know carefully architected um, learning environments for human beings, then, you know, that's, that's hard to do as well. Um, and I guess what I proposed with the imagery of, of sequences and paths was a way in which um, scientists in these different domains could all see parts of themselves, right? So, you know, progress through a course or a core program of study is elemental uh, to, to any accomplishment of learning. Progress through academic transitions, right, or, or school to work transitions are elemental to what the educational social scientists do. And boy, do computer scientists know how to study networks and sequences, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think perhaps an imagery of sequences and paths, you know, sort of might be a way to build to build a shared narrative. So that would be one answer. Um, mm -hmm. The other answer is, you know, might might say the Biden administration, you know, ask colleges and universities. Uh, to combine their scientific resources to improve pathways from school to work, right? Um, and, and then create conditions under which, uh, you know, we would all have an incentive to cooperate around a shared problem that's external to our scientific community. So, um, you know, I think this project might in theory happen through indigenous scientific action, or it might, might come from a, a third party incentivizing okay. us to, to do something together. Okay, it was super interesting. So there's two directions I kind of want to take that, take your answer to. The first direction is you sort of described that it's possible that computer scientists might be really interested in sort of looking at the found data and the sequence of learning exercises that one could get from a well instrumented mm -hmm. MOOC. And it sounds like perhaps your own scholarly research is about correlating kind of degrees with outcomes, whether that's mm -hmm. sort of economic outcomes or health outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. And you offered one solution to sort of try to fill that gap is to kind of tie these pieces together. And an audience member asked like, has there been such a systematic evaluation of MOOCs so far that tries to go beyond just the data that's captured within a MOOC, but also the data before, like who are these people and what are their backgrounds? Mm -hmm. Also what happened to them longitudinally down the line. Has, has that happened mm -hmm. yet? I imagine they're significantly challenging, but. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. So there are some, you know, baked in limitations to MOOCs as, as, um, as data catalysts, right? Yeah. I mean, almost by definition, uh, we don't know very much about these, about learners, right? We only know about learners, what they will tell us. Um, and it, it voluntarily. So all of the things that educators know, you know, matters for people's educational chances are usually not in the data trace. My race, my gender, my, yeah. my ed higher educational experiences, my psychological state when I'm sitting down, all that stuff I don't see. And then also, um, it, it, certainly in the United States, we have paltry um, uh, infrastructure for observing um, uh, learners longitudinally across the life course, right? Um, yeah. we, we know, we, we can observe students moving through K through 12 schools. If they enroll in college, we can observe them moving through colleges and universities. Um, if they're not moving through colleges and universities that have obligatory reporting to the federal government, you know, we don't know anything about those credentials. Um, and so, I, mean, I think part of the challenge here um, is a national challenge about you know, building an observational infrastructure um, that might enable dispassionate observation of how mm -hmm. students move through an increasingly complex educational ecosystem. So the short answer is no, actually we don't. And, and the Nate, we haven't invested in the, in the observational architecture that would really make that possible. Great, so that yeah. you actually kind of answered my second direction in which I wanted to, to take it in. I wrote in my notes here, um, U.S. and states and federal governments do not require measurements of educational outcomes from either educational institutions or MOOCs. And um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I said they don't require yeah. measures of learning, not of learning. Measurements of learning. Sorry, sorry. Learning. Can you unpack that? Yeah. So, um, so if I'm a college or university that's receiving funds um, from the federal government, I am obliged to report students' academic progress in the form of earned grades, majors, and degrees conferred. But there's no measure of the underlying learning that those grades and degrees ostensibly represent. So, um, you know, wh whose Econ 1 is better than another's, right? I mean, I don't have any information underneath the transcript about, about what those grades represent in terms of I learning. See. That's what I meant. I see. Okay. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Then, so my second question, like, it, it's sort of about what you were saying in how to kind of fill this structural gap in MOOC science. You mentioned it could be just from innate scholarship, but it could also be driven through um, policy changes. And you mentioned that sort of the mm -hmm. Biden administration. And I was hoping, could you say a bit mm -hmm. more about what those sorts of policy interventions or, or changes could be yeah. that could accelerate this? Yeah, Recently. and I guess what I what I meant to suggest was that you know, as educators and researchers, could we take MOOC science as the 1.0, right, and replace it with a 2.0 imaginary, right, that we have yet yeah. to build, but that would you know take advantage of the you know the the affordances of the communities that we that we you know um, that we all inhabit. I'm not saying basically replacing MOOC science with something that we might call a science of learning pathways, right? Um, so I, I, I think it's, you know the a, a lot of a lot of academic science gets done in the United States historically um, because the the U.S. federal government you know faces problems um, that by itself it is ill-equipped to solve um, and does not have the institutional capacity to solve that stuff on its own. And um, university leaders under figured this out especially well during World War II, um, and Stanford and MIT were leaders in this moment of recognizing um, that the federal the, the the projects of wartime of the middle of the 20th century uh, were opportunities um, for them to provide scientific service to the government, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in the process, build science. So. Um, you know, waging the Cold War or waging World War II and the subsequent Cold War um, were the motivation for a great deal of scientific collaboration, right? I mean, we say moonshot for a reason, right? A lot of science got coordinated because there was a shared goal, right, of getting a human being to land on the moon, right? 
um, that there was an objective function there. And I'm suggesting yeah. that in the space that we're talking about, there is no objective function at present for filling that structural hole, right? Um, I think one could be developed, right? For example, the lifelong employability of Americans, right? Um, yeah. Or lifelong learning for long life Americans, right? You know, that could be a moonshot um, yeah. that, you know, requires a symbol full of investment in academic science, right? Um, so that's what I mean. I think the objective function could come internally from us, you know, figuring out what a shared goal is as scientists, um, but it could come externally, um, uh, you know, or in negotiation with a potential patron to sort of, you know, figure out a shared objective function um, that would both be fundable from the outside, but sort of scientifically reasonable um, yeah. for these different intellectual communities. Fascinating. So I suppose kind of riffing off that a bit more, we've, we've talked about sort of a bottom up or a top down approach. The bottom up would be the scientists and the researchers and the academics um, working together to define shared goals or sort of a top down kind of objective that everyone can rally behind. Mm. You ended your talk, however, with a whole third party of players. And these are the providers of online yeah. MOOCs and those trying to um, work by an objective function that's typically uh, correlated with, with profits. And my question to you is, mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot, you mentioned it's, it's the wild west and what do you see mm -hmm. um, are the opportunities and the challenges with that third party that you didn't speak too much about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and this is where I think we're at a moment, I, I am convinced we are, as educators um, and as Americans, we're at a moment in history we've never been in before, which is, um, like I said, the presumed cartel that mm -hmm. colleges and universities have held, not for long, right, maybe for a hundred years, have held over um, workforce credentials, is now being challenged by um, a very wide array of alternative providers that don't have any interest in being accredited colleges and universities, but they have a yeah. strong interest in purveying work uh, credentials that they hope will help people um, uh, improve their lives and, and employability. Um, and there's a great deal of private capital um, that is behind those organizations. And it to me is an open question, uh, you know, how, how those providers and the capital that support them uh, will be, for want of a better phrase, governed, right? Like mm -hmm. who's going to make the rules for that sector? Um, can that sector uh, be eligible for government, you know, tax subsidy of various sorts, um, you know, how will quality um, uh, and transparency be recognized in that sector? Um, you know, that's something that Fred Terman at Stanford didn't have to worry. Like he didn't, he didn't have competitors, you know, vying with his master of science degrees in engineering um, in the same way that, um, you know, today's research universities do. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, I see that as a, um, a very important kind of civic challenge, essentially, is um, and, and an important scientific one too, because those those providers have a great deal of data, yeah. right? Um, a great deal of information describing learning and learners um, that would need to be part of the science at some level. And so, you know, I need to have, add another ball to my structural hole, right? And put. Um, you, you know, um, uh, co commercial providers, you know, how do we think of them perhaps as part of this networked science project? Yeah, exactly. So uh, it looks like we're at the top of the hour here. I mean, I, I think my final comment actually is that um, identifying and addressing these sort of structural holes, at least in the context of of AI is, a, is, a, is the in my opinion, the value proposition of a institute like uh, HAI. Mm -hmm. So like, I just yeah. wanted to say thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. And um, I personally am excited. I think there's so many opportunities here and um, um, we look forward to your write-up on this. If, if, if that yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank, thank you, I you really for, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, and thank you to the audience also for, for tuning in and, and for all your wonderful questions. And um, Mitchell, if you can imagine the adulation of of hundreds <laughs> and uh, uh well they, they know where to find me i'd be eager to hear from from any of those on the call um, please wonderful. be in touch awesome okay thank you mitchell see you on the other side